Five, four, three, two, one, fire. Is a nuclear bomb even survivable? In the unlikely event of a nuclear attack, is it worth it to try to do anything? Should we accept our doom? Was the whole duck and cover idea just propaganda to give people hope when there was none? The answers to those questions are maybe, yes, no, and no. Well, thanks for watching. Okay, nuclear bombs are the most destructive force ever created by humans, right? Except maybe Twitter. Nukes are terrifying. What I want to talk about is why, even though they are terrible, you don't need to throw in the towel and count all as lost. There's an old saying about artillery and mortars. It's the one you don't hear that gets you. This is kind of the same when it comes to nuclear bombs. If you are not destroyed in the immediate blast, or in other words, if you know what hit you, chances of surviving may not be as bad as you think. This is why duck and cover can actually be an effective strategy. Duck and cover! But first, let's set the stage. During the Cold War, the threat of nuclear war was tangible. It's argued that the threat is no less now, but it definitely was more prevalent in society then. And we've taken some steps towards scaling back the nuclear threat of mutually assured destruction. In the Cold War, it's estimated that only about 2% of the population actually built their own fallout shelters. That's not surprising though. People are often reluctant to make decisions that would save their lives not just because of the time and money commitment, but also because they first have to acknowledge some uncomfortable truths. Then they have to act on it, even if no one else is doing it, and it goes against the norms. So even though they knew the danger, and they knew everyone else knew it, it went against their normality bias. And they would rather take the risk of doing what was ordinary. Luckily, nuclear war never happened, but that can make people think they were right all along by not being prepared. In the event of a nuclear attack, it really happens in only one of two ways, with or without warning. With warning is when the radars and satellites detect missiles inbound. If this happened, every cell phone in the country would get an emergency alert. Radios and televisions 
would sound the emergency broadcast system. Some places might still use their outdoor air raid sirens. Basically, if you have a warning that an attack will happen, you can get to a shelter. But since we don't maintain public shelters, you'll just have to do your best. So you'll head to the middle of your building at the lowest point possible, uh, hopefully the basement, or you could go to a subway system or somewhere else underground. If possible, away from the outside walls. What happens if you don't have a warning though? This could happen because something slipped through our defense screenings, or there wasn't enough time for a warning, or maybe for some reason you weren't staring at your cell phone to get the alert, or because it's an improvised nuclear device on the ground placed by terrorists or some rogue state. This is similar to what happened in the movie The Sum of All Fears, where a nuclear bomb was modified to fit in a vending machine, then was placed in Baltimore. If your first notification of a nuclear blast isn't a cell phone alert or a siren, but it's a flash that's brighter than the sun, you need something to do immediately. And that's where duck and cover comes in. If you see the flash, you're still alive, at least for that second, so do everything you can to stay that way. If you quickly duck down and cover yourself, you can prevent all sorts of problems because after the flash comes the blast shockwave and heat. If you're far enough away, you can really save your life. You, you might protect yourself from flash burns, flying debris, and more. Radiation is also a concern. The three elements that will limit the impact of radiation are time, distance, and shielding. Time is the amount of time you are exposed to the source. Distance is how close or how far you are to the source and shielding is how much stuff is between you and the source. So if you are far away, limit your time exposed and have a lot of dense materials between you and the radiation, such as lead, thick steel, concrete, or several feet of soil, you're more likely to survive. A surface burst is what we're most familiar with, or what is most commonly depicted in media and movies. It is a detonation that happens where the fireball touches ground and it creates the classic mushroom cloud, sucking up radioactive dust and debris into the atmosphere. This will make its way back to the earth as fallout. But before we talk more about fallout, let's talk about the detonation and its effects. At the epicenter, where the blast occurs, nothing survives. So if that's where you are, sorry. Anything at the center of the blast is essentially vaporized. The damage of the surrounding area depends on how powerful the bomb is or what the yield is. It's measured in TNT equivalent. Kilotons are how many thousands of tons of TNT and megatons are how many millions of tons of TNT it would take to create an equivalent explosion. Of course, there's no radiation involved in TNT explosions. Let's take a look at what the blast zone of different yields of bombs 
could look like by overlaying the blast zone over a map of New York City in honor of the Manhattan Project. The map I'm using is the Nuke Map at NuclearSecrecy.com, which I will link in the description below. This software provides rough estimations and is based on relatively simple calculations, not really taking into consideration terrain and other complicating features. So don't take it as 100% accurate, but for you and me, it's a valuable tool and can give you a pretty good general idea of what to expect. First, let's look at the estimated 10 kiloton yield of an improvised nuclear device, like what could be built with highly enriched uranium by terrorists if they stole the materials, bought them on the black market, or received them from a country like Iran who wants someone else to do their dirty work. What we see on these images is the central fireball in which everything is incinerated. Outside of that, we see the blast radius. Because the yield of this weapon is relatively small, the heavy and moderate blast damage for this bomb both fall closest to the point of the detonation. This is where stuff gets destroyed by pressure in a blast wave, like buildings and cars getting knocked over or blown into bits. The higher the yield, the stronger the bomb, the more damage done. Outside of the worst blast wave, we see the radiation radius. In this zone, 50 to 90% of people will die within a few weeks from radiation poisoning. The next ring outside of that is the thermal radiation radius, in which everybody exposed will probably receive third degree burns. The final ring is the light blast damage radius. Here, windows will still break. These last two rings in particular are where duck and cover are so helpful. If you are at window level, you are exposed to heat and blast, plus more radiation than if you are below the window level, protected by the wall. Next, let's take a look at a 20 kiloton bomb, which was the size of the Fat Man bomb dropped on Nagasaki. As you can see, it's a bit bigger than the last one. This next one is 150 kilotons which is the estimated yield of a bomb tested by North Korea in 2017. And it's a common yield for US cruise missiles. What you will notice about this one is that, well, it's much bigger and it extends well over the rivers on either side of the city. But what really changes with this one is that the heavy damage blast radius outstrips the radiation radius. That means with these bigger bombs, there is a wider proportional blast area compared to the, the radiation. Of course, there is much more radiation than the smaller bombs, but the shock wave goes much further than before. Now, let's upgrade into the megatons. Not Megatron. This is the five megaton intercontinental ballistic missile, which China currently has in its arsenal. Pretty much every nuclear capable country has a wide range of weapons. For example, many of the weapons the US has had, bombs, missiles, warheads, range from pretty small strategic warheads to very large bombs dropped from an aircraft to enormous missiles fired from missile silos in Kansas or North Dakota. It all depends on how they want to deliver it and what they want to accomplish when it detonates. While we're really only talking about ground strike surface bursts in this video, an air burst is more advantageous in many ways because it will still have a lot of casualties under the burst, but will nearly eliminate the fallout and its collateral damage. So anyway, here's the five megaton Chinese missile. You'll notice the entire affected area has grown significantly not thousands of times equivalent uh, to the increase in power, since that's not how the math works, but still quite a larger area. The pressure blast area is much larger again, relatively, but this time the thermal radius is the widest, I guess from the ginormous fireball produced by the bomb. 
Just for fun, let's look at the more than 50 megaton Tsar Bomba. The largest bomb ever tested. There was another Tsar Bomba created, which was calculated to be at least 100 megatons, but they didn't test it because they didn't want to cause the Earth to get bumped out of orbit, probably. Anyway, it created a ridiculously large explosion, and windows shattered almost 500 miles away on Dixon Island. Fallout. After the explosion, the point of detonation is not a continuous source of radiation like a nuclear meltdown, uh, such as Chern Chernobyl. When the blast occurs, the energy is expended approximately 35% as heat, 60% blast and pressure, and 5% radiation, leaving no nuclear core sitting at the center. You have some remaining radioactive isotopes, but it's not melt your face levels of radiation. And after the blast, fallout is your major concern. Here's an image depicting the 150 kiloton detonation we saw earlier, but this time with fallout. This is a fun feature on the nuke map because you can grab that windsock with your cursor and change the wind direction. Fallout will fall heaviest pretty early on since the heaviest and most concentrated debris will fall first. So it's important to get inside and stay inside, especially during the first hour. The longer it has to float through the air, the more it will spread out. So it will cover a greater area, but it will be less concentrated. To understand how wind direction affects fallout, you have to look at it vertically. When a hot air balloon flies into the air, it changes direction by finding a level of the atmosphere that has wind heading in the direction it wants to go. The higher the yield of the bomb, the higher the mushroom cloud. In the military, they use a couple different ways of determining the yield and location of the explosion, such as triangulation, flash to bang to estimate the distance, and even the angle of the height of the mushroom cloud in degrees. Then they couple that with the weather forecast for different levels of altitude in the atmosphere and make a projection on where the fallout will travel. This makes a big difference because at higher levels in the atmosphere, the fallout can travel in a different direction than you would think and much further and it'll be distributed over a larger area. So what do you do if you're caught outside and have fallout on you? Fallout is the debris, including ash and dust, filled with radioactive isotopes. I won't go into depth about the long-term effects of fallout on the environment, including crops, animals, and water supply, but I'll tell you how to do basic decontamination of yourself. Remember, at this point, you are dealing with particles that emit radiation. You have alpha and beta particles, which are primarily an inhalation hazard, but could also uh, be a problem if you ingest it, and if it spends a long, long time on your skin, it could cause trouble too. They don't have a long range, and that radiation can be blocked by very little material. The fallout also has debris carrying gamma wave releasing isotopes, which are much more dangerous and can penetrate much more. Neutrons are blasted out in the initial explosion and are not a concern in fallout. In fact, most of the gamma radiation was also blasted out in the initial detonation. And the isotopes you have now are just what is left over from the original enriched radioactive source and are a byproduct of fission. Some people keep potassium iodide on hand, which is meant to protect against radioactive iodine, a specific isotope found in fallout. The potassium iodide, if taken soon after a nuclear detonation, will saturate areas of your body such as your thyroid with this non-radioactive isotope of potassium iodide and that limits the absorption of the radioactive iodine isotopes. 
Unfortunately, there are still some other isotopes present in Fallout, so this isn't a cure-all. The best thing to do if caught out in Fallout is to cover yourself and protect your respiratory tract. If you can wear a mask, do so. And I mean a real mask, like a respirator, but anything is better than nothing. Once you are inside, carefully strip off all your clothes and keep them in a separate area, preferably bagged up, since you will consider any exposed items contaminated waste. You can only physically remove radiation. You don't deactivate it with activated charcoal or bleach. You just brush off the debris, protecting your airway, and then shower if possible to wash everything you can away from you. Use regular soap and maybe shampoo, but don't use conditioner because the conditioner binds the bad stuff in. The radioactive particles will stay in your hair. If you can't shower, wash off the exposed portions of your body with any water you have. If you don't have any water, wipe them down, preferably with a wet paper towel or wipe. While inside, you will want to use stored food and water. Avoid anything that wasn't wrapped and that was left outside at all. Stay in the interior lowest level, turn off your ventilation system, monitor your radio and other media for information. Since you likely don't have radiation monitoring equipment, you'll need to wait for direction from any existing authorities that are outside before going back outside. Stay inside for at least 48 hours where the worst of the radiation is, two weeks if possible. You give the radiation some time to decay. Of course, this won't get rid of all of it, and some of those isotopes will probably be radioactive for a very, very long time. Remember, fallout is just radioactive ash, dust, and debris, and it can be removed. Fallout alone doesn't create a nuclear wasteland. That's the result of a total nuclear war, which is a discussion for another time. Thanks for watching. I hope you had a blast. Please like the video, subscribe to my channel. Remember, we're preparing for every day, not doomsday, but also maybe nukes.